Stephen, how are you? I'm not bad at all, actually. <laughs> Suddenly so. nine o'clock feels quite early, doesn't it? <laughs> nine o'clock is a horrible time to do a podcast, so thank you very much. I hope you're not doing, well, I don't care actually where you're doing it from. I was going to say, we're not like Robin, who's currently lying in bed doing emails at this time in the morning. Well, whether you are one of our early morning listeners out in your run, doing your gardening, mowing your lawn or driving somewhere, welcome. And welcome wherever you are in the world. Incidentally, half of our listeners today are from outside of the UK. Matthew Grant here, partner at Instec London. Well, despite the relatively early morning start, I did have a great conversation with Stephen Britton, who is one of the co-founders of the InsureTech Gateway. Now, of course, all our guests are fascinating, but it's particularly interesting to hear from the investors in insurance and technology because they get to see so many of the new and emerging companies in this space. But of course, then they've got to support their views with real money. Now, we've known Stephen and his colleagues at InsureTech Gateway for five years, and it has been tremendous to see how they've grown and what's happened to the companies they've nurtured. Stephen shares lots of great insights in here for those both looking at partnering with companies or if you're building your own. And of course, no need to listen these days with pen in hand or of stop whatever else you're doing to take notes. We do all of that for you on the website. So look out in the next few days for the edited highlights from this discussion. So Stephen, you founded uh, InsureTech Gateway in 2017 with your co-founder, Robert Lumley. And like many of our guests, you've had a fascinating career outside of insurance, but you have now ended up in insurance. You've also, uh, in your time, been a product designer and you've founded, I think, three companies, which we're going to talk a little bit about in a, in a minute. But uh, have I sort of captured your career correctly? There's so many things you've done. I want to make sure we're not missing anything critical. Yes, I think that you kind of characterize a sort of part product designer, developer, and the other side sort of working with large corporates to help them innovate, whether that be in a kind of agency role or whether that be within a venture building role. I know that one of the companies you, you founded, which sounded very intriguing to me, but I said that was also an excuse to spend a couple of years doing uh, on-site research, was building or creating a company that provided three-dimensional maps of ski resorts. So is that, is that still going? I still see the products bouncing around the ski resorts, but it was, um, as you rightly say, three years of having that perfect fit of finding something you love something you're good at, and then just struggling to try and find a way to make money doing it. And so after all those really intriguing careers, and I mean, I think you worked for people like BBC and Nike and PepsiCo as well in your time, life clearly wasn't exciting enough. So you ended up in insurance. So what sort of brought you to this point And you know, what was uh, the thinking behind founding uh, the gateway? There's clearly an emerging need in the insurance market for some proper innovators. My network is 50% people who have turned media and the film industry and the retail industry upside down with new models and 50% now from the kind of insurance and venture world. And I just saw an enormous potential in them to disrupt the insurance market. And secondly, I thought that insurance had a really bad rep. And I guess I'd seen in the, from where I'd been as a sort of sector in the sort of sector disruption space, when you know that the base of the industry is good, that the insurance models are right, digital brings this, the digital transformation gives you a chance to go back to those first principles. I saw the opportunity in insurance because fundamentally the um, role of insurance to protect the needy, the uninsured, the unprotected, felt like something really worthy of my time and the time of the people I would hope to bring to this. And I met some interesting people. I met some very long-term thinkers who thought that reinventing the insurance was now, that this was the right time to try and set something up to do it well. So I guess there was an interstellar conversion of a few things for me. And your interstellar traveling at colleagues through space. Uh, so Robert and, and Richard, I mean, how, how do you get on together? You've got the two founders, you brought in Richard as a CEO, I think, which is you know, a real sort of sign of maturity from the founders. And you've got a couple more colleagues you work with in building the business. I mean, uh, are you, do you look for people that are all similar to you to get on with you? Or do you have sort of, uh, in sort of maybe challenging discussions to sort of amplify the best of each of your characteristics and hopefully um, 
moderate <laughs> the, more, the, the, the less strong <laughs> ones. We all recognize the value of each other and we hadn't worked with our type of people before. So we invested, you know, a couple of years to understand each other's value and how we could kind of, comp how, how the sum of the parts would be greater than the, than the individual. So the amusing meeting two years ago where Richard would start talking about, you know, the investment side of the insurance market and how money flows. And I would literally sit there and I would literally just switch off accidentally I'd find myself doodling and he would get, be in despair with me and equally I would start waxing on about brainstorming and about customer needs and things and he would say all right listen we've got five minutes well, what's the decision so we had some very funny moments in learning each other and now we know exactly when to pull in each other's minds for decision making so I guess that's been the fruits of our commitment to each other. I'm just thinking the first time I met you actually was when I was talking to Robert and we've been talking for about 15 minutes and uh, he looked at me and said, hmm, we better bring Stephen into this, <laughs> this conversation. So uh, <laughs> it probably reflects better on, on you than it does on me. But no, it's been great to see that, you know, what you've been through in, in a relatively short time. But you've got you know, a really strong portfolio of companies. You've got 12 uh, companies on the website. Are those the companies in the portfolio or are there some more out there that are, haven't yet made it onto the website? There are 10 businesses that have been backed in the fund so far. They've all kind of graduated from the incubator. I think at any one time we have two or three very active incubations and three or four that are going through some kind of pre-incubation setup. And there's a couple also in the Australia team that are incubations. So I think by the end of the year, we'll be well over 20 and that, that kind of number. I guess you're not totally unique, but you are in a, amongst a very small group of organizations where you're providing what you call a one stop shop which i think actually characterizes it very well so you've got the uh, sort of the advisory side of the business you offer investment funding and you also offer capacity and that uh, you've got the ability to get people onto your um regulated by the fca uh, as, a, as an mga so you're sort of able to give people that contribution the whole whole way through is that have i sort of characterized that correctly Yes, that's the intention. I mean, the, we, we've um, built a set of resources and skills and procedures to a, 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 only on one singular mission, which is to make the journey faster so that a, a great founder with a brilliant idea doesn't lose themselves in admin and stays brilliant and stays great to the end of it. And instead of needing several million pounds to get to a point of any certainty in their idea, they can do it for a fraction of that cost. So the, the period of uncertainty is much shorter. Um, and we believed fundamentally that that was the secret to cracking difficult problems in InsureTech, was to crack the difficult challenges faster. And then in, in terms of where your funding comes from, I believe you're looking mostly to LP or limited partnership investors in the gateway uh, it'd be good i mean i guess for those that aren't familiar with what that means in practice it might be just good just a kind of you know quick explanation of what a lp investor is but also talk a little bit about you know who you look for in terms of providing funds to to support you and your portfolio companies effectively you've got the deep and mysterious early phase of innovation which is really trying to work out whether a concept is it, it even belongs in the world and if the timing is right. And that requires a, a great deal of patience and some mid to long-term thinking. So that really tends to attract, due to its uncertainty, angel investors who get insurance and, and possibly have maybe a more rebellious or long-term view on the market and where it's going. So the incubator is funded by angels who get insurance and want to see reform. The fund really picks out the sort of at the end of the de-risking, i.e. we know what, we kind of know what the idea is and we know what it's trying to prove. We've de-risked some of the bigger issues. Then we're looking for strategic investors at the, as, at the first call. And those strategic investors also tend to be kind of mid to long-term thinkers about the, the shift in the industry, the new growth areas in the industry. Um, and they, um, they um, invest uh, in what is called an, as limited partners, as LPs within a fund. And what that effectively does is puts, we put all the monies into a, into, a, into a fund structure. And then that money is deployed by a fund manager into the businesses. 
which means that it has an independent approval st stage. So effectively, the incubator de-risks businesses and then presents them to the fund. And the fund sees that we've done the diligence and the proofing and the testing so that those investors are protected from hubris of innovators. But not only that, they can look at it with their different hats on. So a strategic in, uh, investor in, as a, in an LP structure can say, well, maybe we can um, accelerate this into multiple countries because we're global. Or maybe we can just bring a team closer to this business because we can really learn about our future selves. The strategic relationship um, with an investor is one where they bring some of the critical resources to scale, but they're also probably there for quite long-term reasons because they're seeing that this is their new marketplace being invented in front of them. So I believe majority of your investors, when you talk about strategic investors, are coming out of the insurance industry themselves. And there's a specific reason you've gone after those in, in investors, isn't there? Part of the proving of the gateway model is that we can scale with the help of the industry. One of the challenges is it's very hard to engage with an insurer by bringing him onto a show and tell event. Um, the LP model effectively commits us to a eight year journey together. It says, we're going to be supplying scale up product models and you've agreed to work with us over the next eight years together for the life of this fund to see how we can make this work. So we, might, we may have formed a bond based around an investment contract, but we are meeting on a monthly basis to talk about how we can all make this work together. And having an insurer investor means that they're, they're thinking ahead for us about where some of these businesses are going. They're starting to think ahead about um, the kind of organization we're gonna have to build to support these businesses and that they're going to have to build to support these businesses. And, and what are you finding about their view of investing in third parties like yourself versus building their own incubators, which you know, in turn they may or may not choose to invest in those companies? I mean, is, is there a shift that you're seeing and benefiting from of insurance organizations you know, recognizing it's, it's a lot of challenges with incubation in, internally and are starting to, to turn to companies like yourself? It's the killer question, it really is. I often find myself in front of a, a head of innovation and my first question is trying to understand how far they are on the learning journey, to understand the kind of relationship that they want with, their, with, with startups, with groups like ourselves. Some want to be passive investors and have very much a, you know, a, a VC mindset, almost like a, a CVC mindset. Some are seeing this as learning for their own organization and are really trying to partner this with their own organizational change. And some are doing it for PR or because they're bored, because it's really fun to go to Vegas and you know, go, you know, what, you know, go and hang out and find out what's new and report it back, but with no, in, no real ability to actually be able to exercise this stuff. So in, in amongst that field of variety that I know that Instate London you know, has that, sees that complexity too, we're looking for active investors that those that have gone past the point of watching and are now trying to work out what it means for themselves. And we're trying to provide a, uh, the best, possibly the best way of having a two, three year view on a growing opportunity space before they really get their business involved. Uh, well, I'm going to come back to that Vegas comment in a minute because uh, I can't resist giving a plug for instead London on that, but you mentioned in passing their CVC. So, uh, as you know, having been on stage, uh, we try to unpick the acronym. So CVC, for anybody that's not familiar, is a corporate venture capital fund. Uh, typically, uh, in this case, for you, Stephen, it would be the uh, insurance companies. But you mentioned Vegas, and we actually, uh, I think by the time this podcast goes live, this will also be out there as recording. But actually, they didn't all get together in Vegas this year. And they did a remote event. We did the the UK leg of that yesterday, actually. I'm not quite sure if we had 20,000 people dialing in for it. It'd be nice to think we did. Um, but, you know, like everything else, that's all gone digital now. And certainly, I mean, those events have their place. But as you say, you bring a lot of people together. And it can be quite difficult to be able to find the you know, people that have actually are offering the services you need. And, yeah, I think of those, you know, all the people who've been to Vegas, if you look at the sort of track record, like a lot of the sort of early stage startups, you know, five years on is probably you know, only a few of them are really still delivering. Um, but I, I, wanna, I wanna come back, uh, Stephen, to the, the, what you look for in your 
portfolio companies. Now, as I look at the companies out there, uh, it strikes me that there's a theme here of organizations that are looking at tackling either the what previously might have been considered uninsurable or you know so hard to insure that people didn't want to tackle it or you know, new ways of helping what areas where there may be insurance but it's not just good enough so you've got uh kate stillwell and jumpstart for example who are providing uh top-up cover after an earthquake based on a sort of parametric index you've got flood flash putting sensors on buildings is that an intentional theme or am i just sort of picking up on the ones that i recognize in your portfolio they've all uncovered new lines of business and yes you're right some of them you could classify as better than the incumbent and some of them are entirely new to world ideas and those that are better have got to be really better and those that are new have to struggle to educate and define and and own their, their this new market space that they're calling their own i mean if, if i give you a two two examples by miles had to be markedly better to the customer. You had to find a group where it was going to um, have a very clear proposition about being better to them. Um, We might see the violence of the new technology of telematics behind it, but at the end of the day, it was just, it's just better for low mileage drivers. And that proposition is clearly understood by a group who have been buying car insurance for a long time. So when we, when we chose groups like buy miles, it was, can we see them markedly better? And can we see how they could engage an early adopter audience? And are they good enough to pull it off? Um, when we met groups like uh, DAS, CoinCover, they said to us, we want to launch the world's first cryptocurrency wallet. And it doesn't exist yet. In fact, the market's not even defined. It's still a little bit Wild West. And we were trying to work out what the noun was. Is it a wallet? Is it a safe? Is it a thing? What is the category? How do we, will the customer understand it? And how do we do that? So they have very different challenges. Um, and what's the right business model? Should they go in with another existing player in the market as, a, as a, the insurance arm? Or should they stand alone and be their own business? And I think that characterizes you know, what we look for, which is, could this, could this group capture a new market? Or are they so much better than the incumbent that people will rethink? Because this is a 21st century solution. You characterized it really well there. I think that's a valuable lesson for anybody looking at the space, whether as a founder, an investor, or, or a partner, which is where there is a really clear distinction between taking on an existing area of insurance. And as you say, you've got to be better or you've got to find that market, you know, such as motor insurance, where there are some categories of ins- the insured that is really expensive, like young drivers, and find a better solution or be bold and tackle the the protection gap or the new areas coming in. Um, but there is that problem of scale that you talked about earlier on. And, and, and so to make it attractive to both from an investment point of view, but also to anybody that's going to offer capacity to an MGA, you, those companies need to scale quite quickly. I mean, what do you, what do you see the challenges of scaling for some of your, the companies that are in that space and, and how do you help them overcome? Or how, I mean, you mentioned earlier about speed, you know, how do you help them, move quickly it's more than just getting out it's more than just getting the sort of administration headaches out of the way it's, it's helping them with the whole distribution and credibility in the marketplace isn't it gosh i mean i think that the barriers to entry for good founders are the were the biggest and most obvious boundary and i'm delighted and dare i say a little proud that we have removed enough of them to encourage some good founders to make a start with the gateway structure one of the biggest challenges I've found in, in the, dealing with the customer, and I mean really the consumer now, the end consumer, is that you don't get the moment to sell insurance, a new insurance. You really need to um, think outside of the box because nobody wants to hear your pitch. The world's most innovative insurance product doesn't go on stage next to Elon Musk. And groups like Gardhog have understood that from a lot of time invested. And they've got their moment because they're now a part of the conversation around the core proposition, which is, would you like to borrow my house? Well, I'll let you borrow my house if I can trust you. Well, I've got this kind of risk score, and this is my former behavior, and this is my telematics or my data information about my previous dealings. And not only that, I come insured, I come warranted as a customer. Like, that's really clever. They found a way to, to, to marry insurance with the emerging economy. 
So I think, you know, that moment of insurance, I smell those, those challenges when a new founder comes in the door and think, oh, how would you even sell that? How would the customer or the broker get that moment of time, the suspension of belief where people would reevaluate insurance and buy a new or a better thing? So I find that one the toughest I've had to deal with from my background in product design um, coming to insurance. So Stephen, you've been outside of insurance, you've been in insurance. You know, what is it about the companies that approach you that you think makes them so interested in joining insurance versus you know, going off and doing something else? And is this just a, a purely an insurance play or is the sort of a technical opportunity really what's driving this? What's interesting about tech founders and in insurance is that tech founders who are trying to prove the brilliance of a, you know, a, a SaaS technology or a, something that really unpicks how risk is measured and calculated, you know, probably from a, from a, a new data source, is that they, they, don't, they never foresaw that they would be an insurance company. You know, the idea that we are an MGA maker is, is, is just a part of the process. They don't, they're not saying we're going to scale to 50 company, uh, countries as an insurance company. They're saying it's really hard for us to demonstrate to the insurance industry how, how um, game-changing this technology is. I think the only way we can do it is to, is to show them. Um, can you help us make a demonstrator, a business that puts our technology into an insurance company? Because once we can show it to them, then you've effectively given us a demo piece and we can then sell that to 50 insurance companies around the world in the two years that follow. So you see that it's not a, I don't understand why that business has got such a massive valuation. Well, it's because once we've proven the insurance metrics, any insurer can buy it, which means it goes from one customer to a thousand customers um, to 50 SaaS licensing deals around the world in three to four years. That's why you get these enormous valuations because they scale much faster than insurers than the insurance market can scale. It's not a book value calculation. It's a pure market growth competitive advantage story. One of the challenges, I guess, for an organization like yourselves and actually for your investors is what metrics do you use to measure the early stage growth of your companies, your portfolio companies? Because clearly metrics such as revenue and premium, whilst at some point they're going to be important, in early stage, they're not really going to tell you whether you're companies are on track or not. So you know, how, how do you give confidence to the, your investors that you're actually seeing performance from your portfolio? We work out what is the killer metric that's going to define the competitive advantage of, a, of any given business. Um, I mean, for example, buy miles is now past this phase, but um, it was a case of um, we, we understood that unless we could prove that the frequency of loss on a per mile based insurance product was um, equal or lower to the current 12 month contract that everybody was afraid of it, that the insurers were, were hugely concerned that the casual relationship of a, of a UBI policy would, would result in a much worse claims ratio. And um, by miles demonstrated over that first year and we were tracking those numbers on a very frequent basis that um, the frequency of loss did not change at all. And that really unlocked the confidence of the insurer to open up the, the segments, the cohorts who were allowed to join and subscribe to the buy miles product. Um, if you take Honcho, which is a Honcho markets, which is a different kind of business. It's a, it's a contender in the price comparison space, like a, like a price comparison site, except it has a very different property. The proposition is around product comparison, as in it helps. The idea is it will help a customer discover the right protection at any for any given risk, and um, and you can imagine that with a behaviour that's been entrenched for fifteen years of price comparison, we're avidly looking at the at the statistics that show that every customer visiting is choosing a better product over a cheaper price. And the iterations of that business have got nothing to do with volume of sales. They are to do with features that are required and the nature of cohorts and segments that might want them. So that study has been designed to fulfill the, with a ruthless focus 
on their unique um, competitive advantage. And over time, over the seed phase, if businesses can effectively avoid the temptation to sound like they're VC ready, to, to pretend that they are um, achieving huge revenue sales, and by focusing on getting the right customer and the right numbers, I believe they have much greater chance of success. And more importantly, in these crucial times, it's a lot cheaper way of doing it than becoming big first and then trying to get your numbers later. How effective are the brokers these days in being able to go and sell this? Because you're reliant on them, unless you've got a direct to consumer model, you're reliant on the broker to understand the technology, uh, explain it to the client, and then also find the insurer that's going to give give them backing for it are they are they keeping up with the pace of change or is that another big challenge when it comes to scale um i mean i think with any group there's um there are early adopters and there are you know the, the later adopter or what do you call it the late majority so if you were to take a room full of 100 in um, brokers you will have a dozen that will come rushing to you and they're wearing an apple watch and they drove a tesla to the meeting and they have got a Nest thermostat at home and they're super excited about the future. And off they go and they can't wait. They're, they're your biggest advocates. The trouble is that the other 88 who have probably got the deepest relationships, the longest known you know, clients that they've been working with and, and they've got a, a more comfortable approach on the world. They, um, they're looking to sustain long-term client partnerships and they don't need the novelty. Um, so I think one of the challenges is you know, the speed it takes for the majority of the brokers to get it and see the, you know, how that's going to um, deliver on what they need, which is long-term continuity of their customer relationships. The biggest lesson we, we have in all of this is to find your early adopter in every group, whether it be the broker, the insurer, the investor, the co-founder. If you find your early adopter, then you've got people with a, like, a, a similar mindset. Get that thing moving and then start working on the next group. Um, so I, I see the maturity in our in the businesses in the portfolio who have shifted from the excitement of meeting the, those early adopter brokers and then them helping um, the founders of the businesses to try and articulate the story for the more traditional mindsets amongst them. Yeah, I mean, that, that technology adoption curve is, is so true in so many industries. In fact, there's a, there's a great book, I don't know if you come across it, I suspect you will have done, which is crossing the chasm more, which is all about how do you move your consumers, your clients from those early adopters to the, what they call the early majority or late majority. And, and the sort of buying habits are very different. But as you say, I mean, if, in fact, I suspect if you could find 10% of the broken community that was a sort of really technology uh, focused, then that would be a, be a really good start. Although I just always, you know, I, I do always sort of think about the fact that the majority of the world is, or the majority of the sort of buying consumer world is um is using smartphones now and you know and are very happy using an iphone or an android and so they kind of do get technology it just needs to be easy for them i don't think i don't think it's a resistance or reluctance to use technology per se it's just the the challenge that you know we all have and frankly having a nest thermometer i'm kind of i've got one but it's still challenging me how to actually use the technology um but Stephen, i knew I, you'd have one matthew <laughs> i knew you'd have one i i have one but i <laughs> reluctantly i must say i i don't like it telling me what to uh what the temperature should be and when the heating should be on but anyway if we have a whole separate discussion about, uh, about thermostats um but we, Stephen, we are kind of coming up to the end of the hour and you've got a, a full day's work to do uh just before we wrap up so Anyone that's interested in knowing more about the gateway or yeah, in particular, I think you're still open to more investors coming in. I mean, what's the best way for them to find out more about you and, and get in contact? If you want to find out more about our structure, you could go to our website, www.insuretechgateway.com, or they could come by you, Matthew. We've actually closed our, we closed our fund um, at the beginning of this year, but we have quite a lot of interest to start another. So we will be opening a second fund um, in a month or so's time. So it's a good time to contact us. Excellent. Well, congrat congratulations on that. And then, and then, and then finally, you know, thank you very much for your support for Instet London as a member uh, and being on stage uh, and sharing your portfolio companies with us. It'd be, it's always great to sort of know why people choose to support us. So uh, yeah, what, what, what sort of your view of what we're up to these days? This is take four, isn't it? Because I said mean things the first three times you asked me that question. <laughs> but, uh, so on the fourth take, what's great about, um, about what you're trying to do is that you recognize that 
the community isn't about the insurer and it isn't about founders. It was a combination of the two. So I do feel it's one of the few places that I can come to and I can talk to a room where there is, where there is um, an intrigued, curious group who represent all, part, all sides. And I've certainly heard the, the language in, in your meetings change from the boo to the incumbent to celebrating that the incumbents are coming. I've joined and have, and have, by just by showing up, I've said, you know, I'm here to learn and see if I can do my bit to make something happen. I'm here to be an enabler, not the incumbent. So I really like that kind of broad church of your community. And I don't know, we were, I think we were all starting together around five years ago. And I just liked your values, what we we're trying to do. And, and you've got a kind of a nice cynical view on people who appear to be doing it rather short termism with a bit with a short term mindset. And that makes me smile sometimes. And um, yeah, I, f- I think I feel that we're cut from the same cloth. Thank you very much for your support. And, uh, and also, yeah, for just uh, all you're doing to support the community and bring in new companies, which is, which is really healthy. And it needs organizations like you to you know, give some oxygen to these organizations. That otherwise, wouldn't have an opportunity to get out there and be seen. So no, really always intrigued with who you've got in your portfolio and, and look for opportunities to get them on stage as well, or these days, until we get back together again uh, virtually. But no, Stephen, well, thank you very much. And uh, on that, yeah, I know you're back in the office. We're sort of starting to show our faces again on the streets of London. So hopefully we'll get together face-to-face soon and maybe even with some other people around us in in some gathering before the end of the year. Steady on. No, look forward to it, Matthew. Look forward to it. (laughs) Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Cheerio. Well, thanks for making it to the end. Now, I do recommend you check out InsurTech Gateway's website. Lots of good insights, and they've got a very amusing blog. Uh, Whilst you're there, you might want to drop in and take a look at our own website, www.instech.london. We are loading up our digital events from earlier this year, so even more chance to see and hear Robert and I talking to some brilliant guests. And of course, if you want to find out why our corporate membership is so popular these days, please do drop us an email, hello at Instech London, or you can find me on LinkedIn. But that's it for today and back next week with another really excellent guest.